Welcome everyone. We're going to go ahead and get started. On behalf of Project Coyote and the Rewilding Institute, we want to welcome you all today to today's commemorative webinar celebrating the silver anniversary of 25 years of Mexican gray wolves back in the wild. We're thrilled you all could join us. My name is Renee Secor and I am the carnivore conservation advocate for Project Coyote and the Rewilding Institute and I'll be moderating today's webinar. Uh, just a quick housekeeping item. Uh, before we get started, we will open to questions from the audience at the end of the webinar. So we encourage you to share your questions in the Q&A feature throughout the webinar, and we will try to answer as many questions as time allows at the end. Today, we have a special guest speaker, uh, Mr. Dave Parsons. And to help introduce today's speaker, I will pass the mic to Camilla Fox, founder and executive director of Project Coyote. Thank you, Renee, and welcome everyone. It's great to have you all with us today. My name is Camilla Fox, and I'm the founder and executive director of Project Coyote. For those of you who may be new to us, we're a national nonprofit organization based in California that works to foster coexistence between people and wildlife through education, science, and advocacy. And one of our core campaigns is Protect America's Wolves. For those involved in the wolf world, you know this has been a hot topic for a long while. With Lobos in mind, I am deeply honored to introduce today's speaker and my close friend, Dave Parsons. We are fortunate to have Dave as a team member at both the Rewilding Institute and Project Coyote, as he brings a wealth of historical knowledge to our programs and campaigns working to protect Lobos in the Southwest. Dave is a career wildlife biologist and received his MS degree in wildlife ecology from Oregon State University. From 1990 to 1999, he led the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service's Mexican Gray Wolf Recovery Program, serving as the program's original coordinator while leading the reintroduction effort 25 years ago. Dave's interests include the ecology and conservation of large carnivores, protection and conservation of biodiversity, and wildlands conservation at scales that fully support ecological and evolutionary processes. He is a science fellow of the Rewilding Institute and is the Institute's carnivore conservation biologist. On a personal note, I will also share that Dave was my graduate school advisor at Prescott College in Arizona and later became a founding science advisory board member of Project Coyote. I'm grateful to call him a close colleague, a mentor, and a dear friend. He now serves as an advisor to both Project Coyote and the Rewilding Institute, advocating for protections for the recovery of the Mexican gray wolves in the Southwest. Today, we are thrilled to celebrate 25 years of Mexican gray wolves back in the Southwest, and there is no one better to reflect on this historic milestone than Dave Parsons. Thank you, and over to you, Dave. Thank you, Camilla. I appreciate that very much. Uh, shout out to the two organizations you mentioned, Project Cody, which I'm really proud to be affiliated with for all these years. And the Rewilding Institute, our, our leaders, and in, in, uh, the efforts to to uh, preserve wildlife, to conserve wildlife, to uh, foster coexistence between humans and wildlife. So proud to be a part of those efforts. And I think I need to turn it back to Renee at this point, uh, unless he tells me what I'm supposed to do next. <laughs> Thanks. Perfect. Thank you, Dave, and thank you, Camilla. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we're gonna we're gonna start by kind of taking a look back at a few historical news clips that aired roughly 25 years ago um, at a really exciting time for Lobos as they were released back into the wild after being eradicated um, from the Southwest in the mid 1900s. So um, Dave will then provide kind of a historical recount of this monumental time and answer um, some questions for me about the reintroduction process and the current population. And then we will conclude with answering audience questions that are sent to us via the uh, Q&A chat feature. Um, so I'll go ahead and, and play these news clips. And then um, those will run for about 10 minutes. Uh, so grab your popcorn and then uh, we'll come back and have a conversation with Dave. is next, the Mexican gray wolf prepares for its historic comeback to Arizona. It's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? 
Live from KVOA TV4 Tucson, this is Eyewitness News at 10. The signature sound of an animal that hasn't set foot in Arizona for nearly a hundred years. Tomorrow, the endangered Mexican gray wolf returns to our state. Good evening, I'm Savannah Guthrie. After years of planning and heated debate, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is ready to bring back the Mexican gray wolf. The wolves are scheduled to be released south of Alpine in the Blue Ridge Wilderness area. That's where Mark Johnson is right now, near Alpine in Hannigan Meadow. Good evening, Mark. Good evening, Savannah. This is a huge story, one that is gaining national media attention. As a matter of fact, if all goes as planned, tomorrow's Mexican gray wolf reintroduction will in fact be history. There will be three wolves that will be reintroduced, one male, a female, and a cub. They'll be introduced into some holding pens just a few miles from where we're at right now. If this all happens, this is definitely going to be a brand new chapter in a book that continues to draw heated controversy. At the turn of the century, the Mexican gray wolf thrived in the desert southwest at the top of the food chain. A predator with an affection for red meat. Oh, good that affection turned to cattle after ranchers settled here to raise their livestock. The wolf and the rancher soon clashed. A massive federally backed program to exterminate the wolf was successful. A victory for ranchers and a major setback for environmentalists. We started experiencing the impacts of an ecosystem that was, that was out of balance. You know, we had predators removed from a natural system. The Mexican gray wolf was placed on the endangered species list 20 years ago. By 1982, there was a federal plan to reintroduce an experimental population of wolves into their historic range. Several sites were considered, but representatives from the Fish and Wildlife Service found what they claim is the perfect spot. The analysis suggests that the Blue Range area is biologically superior in terms of providing suitable habitat for wolves. Bill and Barbara Marks have raised cattle in the Blue Range for five generations. The Marks and other local ranchers say the wolf will run them out of business. And I think we ought to have the most say of anyone because we're the ones that live here. This is where we raise our families and make our living and, and uh, send our children to school. And, and, uh, and uh, apparently it, it doesn't count for much. Bill Marks and a number of other local area ranchers and residents say they aren't very happy with the wolf reintroduction and they're planning a peaceful protest tomorrow in Alpine. They claim that the wolf reintroduction program is just another federal program that is going to force them out of business. We had a chance to talk to Secretary Bruce Babbitt about some of their concerns. Compiled upon top of them. What do you tell a rancher who thinks that the government is trying to shut him down? These wolves are going to bring good things to this part of the country. They're going to bring a lot of interest, a lot of economic activity, uh, ultimately more jobs. Uh, they're going to be good neighbors. Uh, and of course, uh, they were here a long time ago, and I think it's really uh, marvelous that we have the capacity uh, to restore nature, uh, and it's going to be better for everybody. What about the impact of the endangered species on them? So many endangered species. Hi, Bobby. It's great to see you. As you can see, Secretary Babbitt was a little bit reluctant to talk about the endangered species as a whole. Tomorrow, he will be at the release. Hopefully, we'll get a chance to talk to him more, tomorrow more about the endangered species and how it's affecting ranchers here in blue. Savannah, back to you. Okay, Mark, thank you. We'll look for your report tomorrow. Now, from Kega 9 in Tucson, this is Kega 9 News at 10. The Mexican gray wolf will soon roam wild for the first time in almost a century. Three of the wolves were taken from New Mexico to eastern Arizona. Here, they will live in a three-acre pen for up to ten weeks, and then they'll be set free. There are only 175 gray wolves still around. The breed was almost wiped out by ranchers who settled in Arizona in New Mexico decades ago. From Southern Arizona's news station, home of the 1998 Olympic Winter Games, this is News 13 at 10. 
Sparks are flying in northern Arizona tonight following the release of three endangered Mexican gray wolves. It took place near Alpine, Arizona this afternoon. It's a milestone for environmentalists, but local ranchers are not happy. They say the wolves will prey on their cattle. Still, these wolves will someday grow in number, and Interior Secretary Bruce Babbitt says this wilderness has room for both wolves and cattle. My family's been in the ranching business out here for four generations, and I've, frankly, they're members of my family on both sides of this issue. But, but our wager is that there's room enough. The wolves will stay in these pens for at least six weeks so they can become acclimated to their new environment. After that, they'll run wild in the area's 4.4 million acres. I gotta tell you, I never dreamed that the day would come when the Lobo would be back. And it's gonna be good for everybody. It's, uh, it's a great achievement, uh, it's really wonderful. For some, the dream is now reality. The Mexican gray wolf is once again calling Arizona home. It's our top story next on Eyewitness News. It's 10 o'clock. Do you know where your children are? Live from KVOA TV4 Tucson, this is Eyewitness News at 10. Good evening, I'm Tom McNamara. And I'm Patty Weiss. After nearly a century, the Mexican gray wolf is once again calling Arizona home. Three wolves were released this morning near Alpine. That's by the Arizona-New Mexico border. Our Mark Johnson joins us now from Alpine Live. Mark was there this morning for the historic reintroduction. And Mark, did everything go as planned today? Tom, it sure did. And as you mentioned, this was certainly history in the making. There are some environmental groups that have been waiting for today for 20 years. They are ecstatic. For the first time in more than 100 years, Mexican gray wolves are now back into their historic range. But a whole number of people that live in and around the Alpine area, especially the ranchers, they're not happy at all. This is definitely a controversy that will continue to boil for years. Under the watchful eye of the national media, three Mexican gray wolves made history this morning, setting foot on land their ancestors used to thrive on. Two of the wolves decided to check out their new surroundings the second the gates were opened. The other wolf would have none of the hoopla and waited until the cameras left before he stepped out. Secretary Bruce Babbitt claims today's release is a testament to the success of the Endangered Species Act. Yeah, you look at the Southwest, the uh, the way the uh, trout species are coming back, the California condor reintroduction, uh, now this. Uh, uh, we've seen the jaguar for the first time uh, down in southern Arizona. Uh, it's a wonderful act of restoration. I think it talks to the human spirit, to our ability to live on this landscape uh, in harmony with God's creation. Put humans in the equation. Many local ranchers fail to see that harmony. They claim they already have to deal with restrictions from other endangered species in the area. And now they have to deal with the wolf. The, the spotted owl doesn't eat our, our calves. Or the uh, loach minnow doesn't eat our calves, but the wolf will. So, so we, we pay double for the wolf. The Defenders of Wildlife, a national group that helps spearhead the recovery program, says it's prepared to compensate ranchers monetarily for lost livestock. The group is also responsible for watching over the wolves until they're ready to be released from their holding pens. And our goal here is to make sure that people don't come in the closure order. Uh, this is a closed area, so we don't want people coming in and messing with them or coming in just to observe them. We want them to not be acclimating to people. Katie Pruss is a wolf sitter volunteer. She and a few other sitters will keep a watchful eye on the wolves from a distance, making sure they're healthy and eating properly. Pruss says it's a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Well, this is a historic event, and we are restoring the ecosystem, bringing back one piece that uh, has been missing, and uh, this is an opportunity that um, you don't get very often, so it's, it's uh, really a privilege to be a part of it. As we had mentioned, three wolves were released today. Now, by the end of the week, 11 wolves will be here in three separate holding pens. They will be staying for the next several months, getting acclimated to some of the weather up here, and especially the pens. They're going to be released sometime probably in March or in April. Back to you. Mm -hmm. Mark, those couple of females looked like they were enjoying the snow. Had they ever seen snow before? Where'd they come from? Well, they have, Patty. They came from a wildlife refuge in New Mexico. They are certainly used to cold weather and snow, and they're going to be getting a lot of it while they're living up here. Marcus, story will follow. Okay. 
Um, can you hear me, Dave? I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. So we got a quick quick clip of you in there from what was a I'm sure super busy time leading up to the reintroduction and saw some of the lobos exiting their cages. A little blast from the past. Um, so to start us off, um, I guess what do you remember most from kind of that day and and that time period uh, 25 years ago? So uh, you're breaking up a little bit, Renee, but uh, I'll take it uh, from uh, where I where I think we're supposed to start. And uh, one of the questions that you had for me was, uh, how did we settle on the Blue Range as being the uh, primary reintroduction site? Uh, it was a long process of evaluation. Uh, we took our guidance back then from the initial recovery plan in 1982. And uh, those that recovery team uh, recommended that we that the uh, restoration start with the establishment of a population of at least 100 wolves in a 5,000 square mile area uh, in the Southwest within their historic range uh, that was suitable wolf habitat and primarily on public lands. So how do we define suitable wolf habitat? Uh, fairly simple for wolves that are not exactly habitat specialists. Uh, if they've got food to eat and places to hide and, and uh, are safe from persecution, they can do pretty well. And so what they need to eat is the big stuff. So wolves are, are obligatory uh, carnivores uh, on pretty large animals. So uh, we looked for an area that had multiple species prey base. Uh, this is a picture taken of the north part of the Gila wilderness, which depicts prime wolf habitat. Uh, I saw wolf tracks on a trail through here last fall. Uh, looking, this is looking over a place called Aeroplane Mesa for those, those who might be familiar with the Gila wilderness. So uh, we settled on the entire the block of public habitat that had the, the most wolf habitat in the Southwest. Uh, those two uh, four combined to about 7,000 square miles. The prey base there is elk, lots of elk, mule deer, white-tailed deer, uh, javelina, and um, even uh, beavers are known to be a prime uh, prey for, for wolves. So this was the area that uh, we found to be best suitable based on habitat analysis. The uh, wolves uh, occupy a, a range of elevation from uh, these savanna-like uh, oak pine uh, uh, lowlands to a higher elevation ponderosa pine forest. So uh, that's how we settled on the area that we did. We were under a lot of pressure to uh, look at White Sands Missile Range that some people who go way back might remember, and we just couldn't find it to be suitable for wolves. Sorry, you broke up for a second, but I think you're back. Oh. Okay. So the next slide is is the the ceremony, uh, it's the carrying of the crate. Uh, there we go. Uh, so this was a big deal, as you could tell from the news stories, uh, for a cabinet secretary to uh, come on site to be a part of something like this. Um, we were very fortunate to uh, get Secretary Babbitt to come out. And uh, on the uh, left side of the crate, that's Jamie Clark, who was then the director of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, now the director of Defenders of Wildlife. Off to her left is a very uh, much younger version of me. The lady who's 
you can see just the top of her head is Tris Stevenson, who is a granddaughter of Aldo Leopold. He felt it was really important to to involve the Leopold family because of Leopold's history in this country and uh, his epiphany that uh, followed the his killing of the wolf, where he describes the green fire dying from its eyes and changed his eventually changed his views about the role of wolves in ecosystems. So uh, we were able to get Trish to come down. She brought a, our son, who is a, the uh, great grandchild of Aldo Leopold. And behind Jamie Clark, you can't see, is uh, Dwayne Schroff, who was then the uh, director of Arizona Game and Fish Department. And behind this crate are two other crates with other dignitaries uh, carrying them. Uh, so they're what they're doing is depositing the Campbell Blue Pack in the Campbell Blue Pen, which is one of the three packs first released. Uh, and uh, those, <clears throat> that female that we saw, the young female that came out first, was uh, uh, quite successful wolf over the course of, of the program. So this was uh, out south of Alpine, Arizona. It was on a, on a a bench above the Campbell Blue uh, Fork of the Blue River. The uh, organizing of an event like this for a cabinet secretary is, quite frankly, a bit of a, a nightmare. <laughs> a lot of details to take care of. You got to make sure that everything goes well. Uh, the one detail that was most important of all is that we had wolves for them to carry in those crates. And those wolves were over at Seviata National Wildlife Refuge, 200 miles away. Uh, we had to bring them out at the last minute because they had to spend the night in their crates uh, to be released the next day. So I was, uh, while everybody was partying at the Hannigan Meadow Lodge with Bruce Babbitt and Director Clark, having a great time, uh, I and my team, and Volunteers were over at Daviata Refuge, rounding up the wolves from their pens and uh, placing them in the crates. And that exercise often doesn't go quite as planned, but a little longer than we expected. And so we we had to make that 200 mile drive over to Hanneman Hannigan Medical Lo Me Meadow Lodge uh, in the dark of night. We got there probably about midnight with the wolves. The party was over. Everybody had gone to bed. Uh, the lodge was full, of course, and the, the whole wolf team was assigned one bedroom, which we all crashed together in, uh, getting not a whole lot of sleep so we could uh, get going with the program the next morning and get those wolves out to the pen. <laughs> I think I'll, uh, I'll go to the next question from there. Yeah, so I think... Um... Yeah, I was curious, you know, what it, it what it was like watching kind of the first wolves, you know, be let out of their cages and kind of, you know, as you opened their crates, what was your biggest kind of worry or concern at that moment? Yeah, uh, well, it was uh, quite exhilarating for me. Uh, and when I think back on this and from a 25 year uh, perspective, uh, I still have to pinch myself to realize that we were actually allowed to do this. The politics against it were so strong. And it all comes down really to the political window of opportunity that was created by uh, President Clinton and his selection of Bruce Babbitt as cabinet secretary. And uh, Secretary Babbitt had a keen appreciation for nature and, and functioning ecosystems. Um, he had just prior to our program, authorized the uh, releases in Yellowstone National Park and uh, was uh, essentially making a, a, a legacy project out of, out of wolf recovery as part of his uh, tenure as Secretary of Agriculture. He brought up Jamie Clark to be the director of the Fish and Wildlife Service. She was one of my uh, bosses in Albuquerque and uh, a staunch uh, proponent of of uh, bringing uh, bringing their Mexican wolves back and supporting the program. Uh, the scientific name of Mexican wolves, the Canis lupus, 
Bailey Eye, and uh, I hope Jamie doesn't mind me telling this. She had a dog that she named Bailey because she <laughs> he was uh, in honor of the Mexican Wolf. So we really fell into this at the right time. Uh, we hadn't gotten it done under Secretary Babbitt. Uh, you, you all know who came next, and uh, we probably wouldn't have gotten it done. So it uh, was very, uh, very exciting time for me uh, to be a part of this and to get, make it actually happen. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and then, and then I think on on this slide, you know, I was I was curious about um, if you could talk about kind of the founder and the source wolves and um, that were captively bred to create the wild population um, that exists today and kind of how that affects uh, the population in terms of genetic diversity. Yes, uh, we have we have a real problem with genetic diversity, as many of you know, because the Mexican wolves were were almost completely wiped out of the wild. They were completely eliminated from the wild and by about the mid 1940s in New Mexico and by about 1980 in, in old Mexico. So there were no wolves left in the wild when we, uh, when we uh, did this release. Uh, only seven were saved from the uh, efforts to by uh, the predator control efforts uh, orchestrated by the U.S., by the federal government and the precursor of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service back starting in uh, 1915 with the creation of the, the agency to the Animal Dynamic Control Agency to the goal of wiping predators off the face of the earth. Uh, they were really good at it. And, uh, but Fortunately, uh, we had the Endangered Species Act uh, come into play in 1973, and in 1976, Mexican wolves were placed on the list of endangered species, even though there were none left in the wild. In the United States, there were about an estimated 50 wolves left in Mexico. The first effort was to hire a trapper uh, named Roy McBride, who, who had been making a living off of trapping wolves, but this time uh, he was hired by the Fifth and Wildlife Service to catch as many wolves uh, alive as he could. And of course, that trapping effort had to take place in Mexico with the acceptance of the Mexican government uh, to save these wolves. He caught six wolves, uh, one died in a trap, five came, uh, were alive and were placed in uh, three different captive breeding facilities in the United States. Only one of those was a female. Um, she was pregnant at the time. <clears throat> her first litter, I think, was, I'm going to say it was four. It might have been four or five. But it was there was one female and the rest were males. And one pup died out of the litter and it happened to be the female. So we, for the longest time, we just had one breeding female in the entire captive breeding program until two other lines of wolves were proven to be pure. And so that got us up to seven founders, four males and three females, which is not a good place to start. Save a species who really thins out the genetics. And this chart shows how that how that plays out uh, on the, the genome. The lower left uh, image there that says Mexico, those are Mexican wolves, and that's the start of their gene diversity compared with other wolves around the world. The upper right is the Minnesota wolves. And uh, you look at this as a, as a comb with teeth. Every tooth it represents a, uh, a uh, gene location on the chromosome. And the, the length of the bar represents how many different forms, slightly different forms or alleles of that gene exist at that particular locus. And <clears throat> having gene variants at various locuses is important extremely important to the, uh, ability, the ability to adapt to changing environments, to, uh, to uh, uh, what's the word of, to, uh, you know, the survival, the survival of the fittest, so to speak, to, to evolve and adapt uh, as things change around you. And if you, uh, you're missing where, where you see those gaps, there are no, there's only one gene form that at that location, it's called a fixed allele. There's nothing to select from 
if you need to change a bit to adapt to your environment. So uh, the, the wolves were quite disadvantaged uh, genetically. Uh, in fact, because we have so few founders, uh, the wolves in the wild right now are uh, as related to each other in general as brothers are related to sisters. So not a good situation, uh, good situation. It needs improvement. There, there are some gene variants still in the captive population that haven't been moved to the wild. Uh, that needs to happen to uh, boost the genetics as much as we can in the wild population. There's some other issues that go along with that and how wolves are actually uh, released. Right now, the only method being used is to put captive born puppies into the dens of wild wolves. Um, we have some adult wolves that would be great candidates to move out into the wild, but the agencies are reluctant to do that. Uh, there are, in addition to the challenge of genetic diversity is the challenge of human caused mortality. Another major factor that's holding back uh, the uh, growth of the population. Fortunately, uh, I mean, that's, it's a significant uh, uh, <clears throat> cause of mortality. There's more of it than we know. Uh, I was involved in some research that showed that for every wolf that, that we know died from poaching, there's probably another wolf that died that was never discovered. That they don't all have radio collars for one thing. But that's been uh, uh, at least held to a level now where the population has been on a, an increasing trajectory now, trajectory for the last 13 years, with the most recent count being the first uh, top 200 at 241 wolves. 130 some of those are in New Mexico, and the balance is over in Arizona. Mm hmm. Um, yeah, and, and so I guess thinking back to um, that time again, so if you had to choose a singular moment or action um, that is kind of the highlight of your contribution to Lobo Recovery, uh, what would it be? Well, I guess the you know, biggest contribution was, was to navigate the, the incredible bureaucratic minefield <laughs> getting to the point where Bruce Babbitt actually signed a piece of paper saying, yes, you can release wolves. That took seven years. Uh, we, were, we held 24 public meetings and hearings. We wrote environmental impact statements. We did all the scientific analyses of habitat suitability and had to uh, promote what we felt to be the best place to put the wolves and uh, just get through the process, which is extremely onerous under the Dangerous Species Act. Uh, so, in fact, I only, you know, I was retired within a year after uh, all these events were doing. So I, I got to spend very little time on the job with wolves actually in the wild, but uh, I was, uh, take pride in the fact that I got us to the point to get them there. And, Um, yeah, and do you want to kind of explain what's going on in in this picture? We were kind of chat chatting about it before we went live, but um, you know, explain to folks what kind of what that mule is carrying up or donkey is carrying up the. Oh the yeah, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I was asked. Uh, Renee earlier asked me what what uh, event was uh, uh, most enjoyable to me and most memorable to me and. Uh, actually, it occurred two years later in the year 2000 when we finally got approval to uh, put wolves uh, over into New Mexico. At first, we could only put them in Arizona because of the politics of, that were in play. Um, so we got that approval in 2000. Uh, I actually retired in 99, but the uh, field team brought me back on as a volunteer to get involved in the release, first release of wolves into the Gila Wilderness and into New Mexico. Because it's a wilderness, you can't use motorized equipment. So a team had been in uh, 16 miles in, by the way, into the middle of the wilderness from uh, Gila Hot Springs and had built a, a pen made of a nylon mesh uh, on a knoll back in the 
in the Gila wilderness. And we had a release technique for the wilderness that we used uh, pens of nylon mesh with stringers of electrified uh, wire such that over time uh, they could figure out, they would figure out how to chew out. They could self-release once they figured out they could bite through that nylon mesh. Uh, so there was a team that went in with the wolves. Uh, this is Nick Smith, a packer, and at the time a biologist with the Arizona Game and Fish Department who designed these aluminum panniers for transporting uh, wolves and mules in the wilderness. Worked really well. He wasn't sure how it would work, so he had some uh, hound dogs uh, where he lived uh, that he uh, used as test, <laughs> test animals to put in the boxes to see how they would handle it. They did fine, and for that, the wolves did fine too. Uh, their, their boxes were tight enough that they couldn't really move around much. So we rode all day, so 16 miles to get to the pen and uh, carried the crates into the pen, closed it up. <clears throat> the whole team spent the night at a camp about a mile away, and then uh, and I was asked to be the person to stay in solo. Uh, and camp with uh, telemetry gear and monitor uh, these wolves to see uh, when they came out of the pen. And, and they were pretty quick to figure out they could chew out of the pen. And probably the second day, I'm sitting in my camp uh, right around dusk. Uh, I had taken a telemetry reading earlier and it had come from the direction of the pen. Uh, we didn't want to disturb them any more than we needed to. Uh, we did most of the monitoring remotely. So as I'm sitting there, all of a sudden, uh, uh, essentially a point blank owl came off of the ridge right next to my camp, probably 50 yards away, uh, full on wolf howl. And I got my attention, of course, and I realized they're out. And uh, sure enough, I turned on the equipment and the wolf was right close. So it was almost dark and I was really craning to see if I could see this wolf. And finally it moved across the ravine and right, right in, probably 30 yards in front of me from uh, going up the hill from my camp. And I could just barely see it still wet. But uh, being the, in the middle of the wilderness by yourself, and being the first person with the privilege of hearing wolves howl in, in the wilderness in probably 50 years was a memory that I, I, I'm sure I won't ever forget. Yeah, I have to definitely say I'm jealous of that one. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so next one, I was wondering if you could share kind of a behind the scenes uh, blooper reel, kind of, you know, what's the funniest thing or mishap that happened uh, during your time leading the program? Um, and I think you mentioned uh, this photo and yeah, have you explained that experience? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bit hilarious. Um, I actually call this wolf tipping. Uh, this was uh, actually a second release. And the short story is that there was uh, five of the initially released 11 wolves were shot in the first year. And we had to repair some, some uh, breeding pairs and uh, put some more wolves out in, in uh, 1999. And this was one of those wolves. and. Uh, Bruce Babbitt was so dedicated to this project that he came out a second time in 1999 and said, you know, we're not going to let uh, vigilanteism uh, get in the way of this project. And uh, there's, as he put it, there's room enough for wolves and uh, livestock ranching, and we're going to make this work. And so we we brought more wolves out in 1999, and uh, these were carried in into a crate. This is that same pen, the Campbell Blue pen. Uh, in a, the same kind of a ceremony without all the media attention this time. And one of the, one of the, again, one of the wolves would not come out of its crate. And these were in a, your typical dog uh, kennel kind of crates. So there was a top part that, you know, had uh, see-through mesh. And the wolf would not come out. And uh, so we waited for everybody to leave and we waited for all the media folks leave and we when we thought everybody was gone and there weren't any cameras on site. Uh, we went over to that crate, we picked it up, tipped it upside down, shook it, and the wolf just wedged itself in and wouldn't come out. 
and we stepped back, gave it some time, and it just was still hunkered down in there and uh, reluctant to come out. So <clears throat> we got a screwdriver. We took all the bolts out of the top half of the crate, and it was just curled up in the bottom, laying there, and it still wouldn't come out. You know, we brought it and and shot out of the sand back, and uh, they were just so timid, so intimidated by <clears throat> human presence. So finally, we just <clears throat> eased up carefully and skipped it out of the crate, and finally reared up and jumped out. We didn't realize till later that the agency photographer was still on site and he captured it all on film. So <laughs> that, that was one of the, the vaccine bloopers. <laughs> the only time I've ever heard of wolf tipping. <laughs> um, so I think we have, yeah, time for uh, two more questions and then we'll open it up to the audience here in a second. But um, what's, your hope for the next decade of Lobo recovery? Well, my, my main hope is that the population flourishes, that it's allowed to achieve uh, distribution and density that allows it to be ecologically effective, carry out its role in the ecosystem. Uh, I'd really like to see the Interstate 40 boundary come down because right now uh, wolves are not allowed to move north across it, and that boundary is right above that area number six down there. This is a map produced by some independent scientists as to what wolf recovery in the west ought to look like, and especially uh, those three nodes in the south would have been, would be populations of Mexican wolves. Uh, number six down there is the current population in the, in the blue range of uh, that is the only population we have right now, 240 wolves. There are uh, suitable corridors for wolf movement from that area up to the Grand Canyon region, which is node number five, and to the Southern Rockies uh, in Southern Colorado and Northern New Mexico, which is new, node number four. Those scientists believe that we needed to have a population of at least 750 wolves distributed in those three subpopulations and connected by corridors where wolves could move back and forth. And eventually over time, uh, there are corridors that would potentially allow wolves in the south to reconnect with wolves in the north again, like was the case before we started killing wolves. So that whole complex up just at the top of the screen is the Northern Rocky Mountain region with the Yellowstone and Idaho and, and, uh, and uh, Northern Montana. That was the grand vision uh, for that to happen. Uh, the I-40 boundary has to come down. Uh, I know that those of you who have been act, uh, advocating for wolves, uh, this has been one of our top priorities. We've recommended it every time there's a change in the rule and we uh, it, it never happens because the states are adamant about keeping that boundary and keeping wolves south of it. Uh, the other thing is there is uh, there used to be a hard cap on that there could be no more no more than 325 wolves. That's spelled out in the recovery plan. Presumably that cap's been removed, but the the newest uh, regulation ties uh, the population to what's recommended in the in the recovery plan, which was revised last year. And the recovery plan calls for only 320 wolves in the United States and another 200 wolves down in Mexico. And that's, that's enough wolves, according to the recovery plan, to take them off the endangered species list. And most of us in the conservation community don't agree with that. We decide with these scientists who feel like there ought to be at least 750 wolves in the United States in these separated populations. Uh, so we'd like to see uh, a situation where nobody's paying attention to how many wolves there are, that they're just allowed to uh, move across the landscape, establish their natural densities. And by the way, they don't, they control their own numbers. They, they won't uh, overpopulate. That's not in their best interest to eat all their food. Uh, so that's built into their, the way they operate, the way they, the way they uh, 
exist on a landscape is they self-regulate through establishing territories and uh, that's how they uh, base them out fills out to have the, uh, the benefit, beneficial effects they have on the ecosystem, keeping prey bases in check and uh, actually improving the biological diversity in their ecosystem. So I would like to see a situation where the wolves are finally just allowed to be another wild animal on the landscape uh, living under their own terms. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm gonna jump into uh, Q&A from the audience to make sure we have enough time for, for folks. And um, I see a question from our colleague and uh, friend at uh, the Rewilding Institute, John Davis. And I think this is a good one to kind of touch on and talk about uh, the Rewilding Institute's work on the Mugian Wildway. So his question is, what does the Mugian Wildway mean for Mexican wolves and other wide ranging wildlife species? As we're talking about kind of habitat and rewilding of the, of the Southwest. Now, the Mugion Wildway is uh, is what we're calling that that section of of between numbers five and six on that map. That's the Mugion Rim. It's uh, where the the Pla Colorado Pla Plateau drops off sharply by several thousand feet to a lower elevation. It uh, uh, has essentially contiguous. Uh, National Forests and Bureau of Land Management lands, uh, federal public lands, all the way from the Gila Wilderness to the Grand Canyon region. Uh, we know that this is a viable corridor because uh, several Mexican wolves have traversed it. They've crossed I-40 into the Grand Canyon Eco region, region. One of the most famous went by the name of Anubis. That, that did that twice. It went. Crossed the line, was up around Flagstaff, and the agencies brought it back, put it back down around number six there, and it made the same trip again back up to uh, off I 40 and over around Flagstaff. Uh, and uh, this time was uh, shot by a hunter who who uh, likely made the claim he thought it was a coyote, which is how most wolves get shot, or at least that's the excuse most people use if they get caught. So. Uh, that's the Modillon Wildway. Uh, we think it's really an uh, important corridor for uh, broad landscape scale ecosystem restoration uh, in the Southwest. Uh, um, once we uh, secure that, we need to go to work on that corridor going from six to four on the map, which is the uh, uh, a wolf just recently traversed that corridor for the first time. Uh, it was given the name Asha by the school kids that named wolves. And it left the area of number six and got almost to number four, uh, and almost to the Colorado line. But uh, again, the agencies uh, uh, followed the rules in place and captured it and actually brought it to cap back to captivity is pairing it with a mate and has plans to uh, release that pair down in Mexico once they've uh, proven to be breeders. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to just so folks know, um, to learn more about kind of the Rewilding Institute's work in the Mugian uh, Wildlife Corridor, you could go to rewilding.org. Um, we have an active campaign to work on protection of that uh, corridor. Um, and also have a press release on and some information on Asha and, and her movement um, earlier um, this year. Um, so to jump to kind of a different question and topic. So we have another question that says, given the smaller size of Mexican wolves, is there any issue of hybridization with coyotes or the larger red wolf coyote hybrids that per persist in the South and Southwest? We have not seen that to be an issue. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, there they are. A, a, an average Mexican wolf is 50 to 60 pounds for the females and maybe 70 to up to 80 pounds for the males. Uh, our coyotes in the West are 25 to 30 pounds at most. Uh, so there is a bit of a size difference. Uh, one would think, uh, given the the annihilation of wolves on the landscape and the dearth of mates of their own species, that there would have been some 
some significant hybridization, but it, it didn't happen in the West. And I, uh, I don't know that there's a good explanation for that, but we don't find uh, uh, many, if any, uh, wolf coyote hybrids in the Mexican wolf population, like you see in uh, the Midwest and in the Red Wolf program. Uh, they are naturally antagonistic, like wolves and coyotes are most other places. Kind of another related question on, on genetics. Um, someone asked, uh, it looks like there are several chromosomes in the Mexican wolves that show very little heterozygosity. I hope I said that right. I always mess up that <laughs> in genetic terms, but show very little heterozygosity at the genes examined. How does this lack of genetic diversity affect the prospects of survival for the wild Mexican wolves going forward? And is there any thought of bringing in other closely related gray wolves to increase this genetic diversity? Or is there opposition to this idea because of the unique nature of the Mexican wolf? Uh, great question. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, it certainly affects their ability to adapt because natural selection and adaptability requires the uh, natural events and natural processes. and. Uh, natural selective pressures to select for those genes that offer the most advantage to the animal. And if you don't have genes to select from, you've got to, it's going to be very difficult to adapt. So yes, I think it's probably a problem uh, for long-term adaptability. Uh, the uh, idea of mixing uh, northern gray wolf genes into the uh, Mexican wolf genome has been recommended by geneticists and scientific papers as probably necessary eventually to uh, accomplish what's called genetic rescue of the uh, severely uh, bottleneck genome of Mexican wolves. Uh, this was done, a similar uh, approach to this was done with the uh, Florida panther and mixing in some Texas cougar genes because that population had gone, gone severely inbred. And that's been quite successful. There's been pushback uh, by both the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the state uh, wildlife agencies to the idea of uh, bringing in some northern gray wolves to boost the genetics. Uh, to me, the, the, the most practical way to allow that to happen would be to uh, break down that I-40 barrier and allow Mexican wolves to move north. And especially uh, once the wolves are reintroduced into Colorado, uh, there would be a population of northern wolves uh, within uh, <clears throat> dispersal reach of Mexican gray wolves that they could then begin to interbreed with, which was, you know, the natural uh, arrangement of wolves back in the day, there, never, there wasn't a gap in the wolf population between Alaska and Mexico City. And, uh, you know, wolves varied by, by a natural selection of different ecotypes uh, from north to south, but they were all inter interconnected genetically. So there's really no hard line that, that defines and, and separates one subspecies for another. There was all this intermixing going on and a zigzag sort of pattern all the way up the Rocky Mountain chain. So we could just let the wolves be low wolves and take down the barriers to movement. And eventually I think the uh, Mexican wolves would join up with some Northern wolves and there would be natural patterns of mean exchanging take, taking place again. If that doesn't happen soon enough that I, I would favor doing the, the controlled uh, in, in, injection of some of those Northern wolf chains. Yeah. Um, relatedly, someone asked about, you know, we're talking about connectivity and, and a lot of connect connectivity with northern uh, populations. But um, what about connectivity with wolves in Mexico? And is there any potential in this regard? Well, uh, connectivity with wolves in Mexico would be is is important. It's, it's considered in the uh, recovery plan. Uh, the problem being that population is used as the same source population as the one uh, in the United States. So they all come, they all have the same uh, 
problem of uh, genetic bottlenecking. Two, two separate populations of wolves from the same captive source population. So they all go back to those seven founders. Uh, some interchange would be good, but uh, it's not going to be nearly, you know, it's not going to really bring uh, new genes uh, to uh, the separate populations per se. Uh, of course, that interchange is greatly uh, hampered by the border wall. And uh, mm -hmm. hopefully that border wall will come down or at least be made permeable. So uh, if wolves do get established in substantial numbers in Mexico, they could interchange uh, with those in the United States. That's happening right now or has recently in a gap in the wall over in Arizona where there is a, a, a family of wolves that is moving back and forth across the international boundary right now. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to find the question I wanted you to answer. Um, so I think, of course, there's so many good questions in here, um, but um, somebody wanted you to explain a little bit about why um, uh, authorities only release pups and cross fosters and um, why the agency isn't releasing adults and adult pairs currently? Mostly it comes from uh, positions that are taken by the state game and fish departments and the assumptions, more or less unfounded assumptions that uh, captured bred adult wolves are uh, more habituated to humans when they're released, more inclined to uh, engage in conflict with uh, human activities by coming too close to humans or, or livestock uh, that's really not borne out in, with actual data. Uh, what has been seen in a few cases is when the bonded pair of wolves, of adult wolves with pups are released and they're a, you know, established bonded pair, not just a shotgun wedding at the last minute in captivity, those do much better and uh, really uh, don't engage in conflict uh, any more than any other wolves. But uh, states right now are opposed to that, so, but they do support the, uh, the me method called cross-fostering work. Uh, wolves in captivity from uh, parents with uh, uh, genetic makeup that is needs to be moved out to the wild. Uh, if they have pups in captivity, uh, Dan is found in the wild if it's had pups at about the same time. And then they take some of those pups from captivity and insert them in the wild den. Uh, it works. Those, uh, wild mothers accept those wolves and raise them. Uh, right now there's been, I think there's now been been six or eight years since an adult wolf was released, all the releases since then have been of these uh, cross fostered pups. Uh, about 80, I think, now have been placed. And um, there are something like 14 of those cross fostered pups that are known to be alive in the wild, and um, much fewer that have actually reproduced in the wild. And so that you know, the genetic uh, effect of that method uh, doesn't take place until those wolves mature and breed on their own in the wild and mix with, you know, mm -hmm. other wolves in the wild. So it's not an immediate effect. There's a whole lot of mortality in those wolves. There aren't that mm -hmm. many that make it uh, to the point where they're, where they're mixing those, those important new genes into the population. Mm -hmm. Um, so of course we're running out of time already and there's so many good questions, but I selfishly want to ask, um, my personal last question, which is what is your advice, um, for those of us dreaming of becoming the next Dave Parsons? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd say go for it. Um, it, it's the government agencies that have the authority to do these things, but you know, we, the conservation community, can only sit on the outside and encourage them to do the right thing. So you have to have uh, dedicated 
uh, conservation biologists in positions both inside the agency and uh, independent uh, scientists as well on the outside and advocates pushing for the right thing. Uh, so we have to work both from inside and outside government agencies to make this happen. Um, so I say go for it. Uh, there are <laughs> it's, there are some difficult aspects to working inside the agency, but I say uh, the way to navigate that is to refuse to be bullied by your boss or compromise your ethics or fudge the science or break the law, all of which happened to me. And then once you've held your ground and you've gotten the right thing done, just be ready to enjoy your early retirement. <laughs> Challenge accepted. <laughs> um, all right. Well, of course, we're running out of time. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and, and wrap things up. Uh, but first, I want to give a, a huge thank you to Dave, um, you know, for not only for today's wonderful webinar, but also for his years of dedication and advocacy for Lobos um, in the Southwest. You know, Dave is uh, a major reason why Lobos remain roaming, roaming throughout the wild today. Um, and we're forever grateful for his relentless advocacy and dedicated dedication, as well as, as well as all the knowledge that he brings to both uh, Project Coyote and the Rewilding Institute. So um, thank you so much, Dave. Um, this was fun. And lastly, I wanted to also remind folks if you aren't already a member of Project Coyote or the Rewilding Institute, um, please sign up for our e-teams to receive updates and alerts on how to advocate for lobos and other carnivores nationally. We have a Protecting America's Wolves and Carnivore campaigns in, in both organizations and work actively on these things. So you could do so by going to projectcoyote.org um, and sign up for Project Coyote's e-team, as well as rewilding.org to sign up for the Rewilding Institute's um, e-alert. And yep, one last quick. Mm -hmm. One last quick thing, Renee. I forgot to model my shirt. And this is for you. Oh, yeah. You, you, those of you who were there back in the day, this was the original uh, Lobo Advocacy uh, t shirt by, I, I think, commissioned by what well, might have been called the Wolf Action Group back in, in the late 1980s. I've kept it in the bottom of my t shirt for all these years and, uh, and bringing it out for this occasion. <laughs> I love it. I love the hot pink color too. <laughs> but awesome. Well, thank you, Dave. Thanks everyone um, in attendance. Uh, like I said, please sign up for our e-teams and um, I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.